I've got Maureen McAteer coming up to tell us about her third sector um, GERFEC project, a partnership between core organisations, Bernardo Scotland, Voluntary Action Scotland and the Improvement Service, and she also has other support from other third sector organisations and Scottish Government. Maureen is the project manager and she's going to tell us about a culture of collaboration. Thank you. I'm the woman who stands between all of you and your lunch, <laughs> unenviably. Um, so I was asked to come along today and talk about a culture of collaboration. And to be honest, a, a more honest uh, working title for this would be a shameless pitch for the third sector for us all to be working much more closely in partnership with each other. So I'm going to do a wee bit of scene setting because our work is wider than just GERFEC, it's actually about children's services planning. So it feeds into a lot of the complex landscape of our service delivery across Scotland. And really, despite the complexity, there's a high level of consensus about the direction of travel that we're going in the country. And this is commonly called the Scottish approach. And really, it encapsulates the principles from the Commission on the Future Delivery of Public Services, which you'll all probably know as the Christie Commission. And the Christie Commission had called for a radical new collaborative culture throughout public services and stressed the need for us to build our infrastructure with and around children, families and communities to achieve better outcomes. So the operational reality of rising demand and increasing costs means it's absolutely imperative that we come together to work to maximise the value we can achieve from the resources that we've got. And I think this can only be done through system-wide commitment to greater integration and collaboration. However, anybody here, and I'm sure many of you are involved in partnership work, know that this is not easy. It's not easy at all. And as we heard about earlier this morning, the intergenerational inequalities in our communities are long-standing and have deep roots. I think the other thing to say about this is the vision that's been set out in policy and legislation, it demands a really significant shift in the culture that we currently operate in, both at an individual and an operational level. It involves us to have an extensive review of our embedded ways of working and it challenges all of us to work in a much more bottom-up way that's outcomes-led, that's preventative and that's integrated. Working much more closely with individuals and communities to understand their needs and to listen to what it is that they're telling us that they feel they need to make a difference. Therefore, I think our aspiration to make Scotland the best place to go up requires a huge amount of persistence and determination over time. You know, we need willing partners who are prepared to embrace new ways of working, as well as being able to stop doing things that we know don't work. And, you know, this is very, very difficult to do because we've all been attached to ways of working and think that, you know, projects that we've been involved in that we think are good, but there's actually no evidence of improvement in the outcomes of people who we're serving. So we really need to focus on those things. So our project, it takes the high level aspirations that have been set out in the policy and legislation. And what we try and do is support children's services partnerships to explore what the practical actions that they can undertake that will support implementation of these locally. So we're engaged in a whole range of activities locally and nationally to support community planning partnerships, third sector interfaces and the third sector more widely to strengthen the implementation of GERFEC and local children's services planning structures. A really crucial bit of this is embedding the role of the community and third sector in community planning. The project was set up because the range of partners who are involved who um, Catherine had mentioned believed that the third sector has got a pivotal role in helping to make Scotland the best place to grow up. And we also want to contribute continue to enhance and strengthen the current contribution that the third sector make. So we believe we can grow full participation in a number of ways. So the first one and the sort of primary piece of work that the project's engaged in is supporting robust and meaningful engagement in local community planning infrastructure. 
So in 2012, Scottish Government and COSLA made a joint statement of ambition, which basically placed community planning arrangements at the very, very centre of the public service reform agenda. So in order to be able to influence, the third sector needs to have a very strong voice at that CPP planning table. However, CPPs, and some of you here might share this, they can feel very, very complex and remote structures. So a big part of our job is trying to demystify some of that and encourage people to participate and engage in that local infrastructure so that they can influence service design and delivery. Secondly, this is where the shameless bit comes in, we tirelessly promote and advocate for the third sector with a wide range of stakeholders. So as a project, we sit on a, a high number of sort of strategic groups and talk about the contribution that the third sector make. You know, it was lovely to see the marketplace with, you know, where you get to see all the absolutely fantastic work that a whole range of people provide. But we have to continually remind people that we're here and that we're able and willing to be effective partners with them in changing outcomes for our communities. Thirdly, within the sector, I think there also needs to be a much more full and frank conversation about what our needs are for capacity building and improvement. There's huge amounts of collaboration that happen organically within the third sector, but I think in our work, what we've discovered is there is a need to map some of that, there's a need to develop some of that, and there's a need to scale some of that up so that collaboration becomes the embedded way of doing things. Interestingly, in a recent piece of research that was carried out by GCVS in Glasgow for their Everyone's Children GIFEC project, 65% of people who responded stated that larger third sector organisations should improve how they work with smaller organisations. Many of the big children's charities have excellent relationships locally with their community planning partnerships. And what we are trying to do is encourage them to generously share some of those connections so that we can all work in a way that's much more collaborative and benefits everybody. So alongside this dialogue with the larger charities, we also work in partnership with Voluntary Action Scotland, who are one of our public social partnership partners. And we also try and offer support to all the TSIs across the country who have responsibility for supporting the third sector, large and small, um, to effectively engage with community planning. I'm not going to do a history of TSIs, you'll be delighted to know, but the important thing for you to know is that these are relatively new structures, so they're still growing and evolving and learning themselves. So we really want to support them in the time that we're around to help them think about and develop their role a lot with, in consultation with their member organisations and other stakeholders because th the bottom line is TSIs are going to be an absolutely crucial organisation for us to strengthen if we want to achieve the aims that we've set out. So if it's not obvious already, why is it that we want to do this work with others? And I think the obvious answer is we want to do it because we believe that working together, we can deliver a lot more than what we can do on our own. Obviously, the idea of working together is, in an integrated way is not new. And Phil talked this morning about how you know, the, the whole legislative process has been about trying to speed up the pace and the scale of the change that we want to see across children's services. And there is no question that this is a huge challenge. But I suppose for me, I think it's also a bit of a once in a lifetime opportunity to change the way that we work at a kind of cultural level that will hopefully make a massive difference to our children and young people. So while there's always been elements of our work where we've worked with a range of different professionals, what we're talking about here is something new. We're talking about giving up some of the entrenched ideas of organisational boundaries. And if we're serious about putting children and families at the heart of our service plan and delivery, we need to think about new ways of doing that. Therefore, a key aspect of delivering our aspirations is about building collaboration, which supports much deeper, much more meaningful um, partnerships within and between sectors. Statutory organisations can and do gain an awful lot from working with the third sector, given the third sector's experience and understanding of the children and families and the communities that they work in. And in addition, the third sector can be a massively rich resource for the people who are going to be tasked with delivering the named person service. But a really big bit of the jigsaw is that named person services need to know 
how to access the rate, what the services are in their locality and also how they can access them on behalf of children and families who are in need. So in short, I think that we are really advocating that partnership moves from being in the sort of desirable you know, column or you know, it's very much seen as the cherry on the top when you've got a wee bit of ability to, to do it. And we think it needs to be much more core business. It needs to be essential and it needs to be built in and embedded to, to the way we do things. So you, you'll be surprised to know there's a few challenges. Um, the financial pressures on budgets in both the strategy and the third sector are absolutely enormous. And this can lead to a whole bunch of difficulties. The third sector often have this sort of um, complaint that they're not given parity of esteem and the contributions that they make aren't always recognised or fully acknowledged. I think it's important to point out that the third sector work with some of the most disadvantaged children and families in our communities, yet they've always got to live with really short-term funding cycles where it makes it very, very difficult for them to plan and long t for the long term and really achieve some of the aspirations that they've got for, for the communities that they work in. The complexities lie on both sides. Strategy partners have got a really unenviable task. They've got to lead, manage, implement integrated children's services plans. And obviously, from their perspective, the third sector is enormous. Uh, there's wee organisations, there's big organisations. You know, they're, they're certainly not all the same. And it's so vast and disparate, it can be very hard for them to engage with us meaningfully or equitably. Also, local authorities and health boards have got a tricky balancing act because they are also responsible as single agencies to deliver statutory duties under the act. But they've also got the task of trying to generate this collaboration and this joint working, which means that we're delivering services in a much more holistic way. I think sometimes the involvement of the third sector can just get a wee bit lost in some of the complexity of that. And as I've already mentioned, the third sector need to commit to working together much more. Sowing the seeds of partnership is always difficult, but it's especially difficult in the current climate of you know, reducing resources. Um, we've came across loads of examples of individuals or organisations doing amazing pieces of collaboration, which is no mean feat because it's quite a step out from how things are done normally. So I think people are very trusting and courageous to try and engage in that type of work. I think everybody understands there is absolutely no alternative to putting aside the, the, the sort of um, short-term competitive for the long-term goals, but we definitely need some help from our statutory colleagues because the way procurement and commissioning work, it actually drives competition rather than complementing each other. So we would really like to see a shift in that. I'm having to speed up here. <laughs> Nearly finished. So finally, in the messiness of the lead up to the implementation of the Act, which I'm sure Bob is going to be talking about this afternoon. I think it's really important that we look back and think about just how far we've travelled down this road. I mean, certainly in my working life, I think it is absolutely different now, the way we organise services, the way we work together. And I've been really blown away by some of the partnership work and at a sort of you know small level with the team around an individual child to a much more strategic level I think we've made absolutely huge progress and I suppose you know processes leadership strategies legislation it's not those things that are going to deliver the change it's actually realizing the potential of all of us so I've got we'd love you to get in touch we are absolutely not experts on partnership we would love to hear about any examples you've got and you can hear more about our project or learn more about our project through our website thank you very much thank you very much Maureen and um I think that the, the whole of us coming together in this room rather sums up your, your phrase, Maureen, that we can achieve much more together than we can if we're all working individually.